Okay, so here's the second part. Uh, again, as I mentioned uh, in the announcements on the site, I do apologize for my techno peasantry. Um, it seems like, uh, however, I do actually have uh, the material worked out. Uh, things successfully uploaded. Uh, and so I think the process is basically smoothed out. I've now switched software like three times. Um, I'm still having some weird video conversion issues, but it looks like now I can just record it in one format that YouTube won't choke on, uh, which also means I can probably cancel my Vimeo. Um, several people have commented that the video quality uh, did indeed drop, however, between this week and last week. Um, that's unsurprising uh, because uh, last week I was recording in uh, like 4K or something, um, which meant that I was yielding these like enormous uh, video sizes and honestly it's not totally clear to me that in this particular context you need to be able to count the uh, hairs in my eyebrows or whatever uh, so yeah so the quality is a bit lower but hopefully uh, at least the sound quality uh, is is better uh, I also swapped out the squeaky chair I don't know if you noticed yesterday but I'm on kind of a mealy chair um, rolly mealy chair with padding which is pretty good but it's scuffing up my shins anyway okay so um, as I mentioned, right, for this part two, uh, there are sort of three things that I want to cover off. The first is the uh, sort of uh, tables of correspondence, right, the doctrine of signatures, tables of correspondence, system of correspondence, and giving some examples. The second is that I want to expand some of the trust, trauma, transparency material that we've probably discussed with an eye towards moving towards the theory of the Neurathian bootstraps, that you can see a bit of that. And then the third is somewhat time permitting, I want to drill into the conception of uh, Vervakian uh, insight, right, uh, as sort of proposed by Vervakian, uh, Vervakian Ferraro, uh, link that back to some of the consciousness theory stuff lightly, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into that too, too deeply, but then move from that to a conception of wisdom, specifically speaking, um, and sort of use that to unpack the direction that this stuff uh, in general should be taking. So that's the game plan for part two here. Uh, and the hope is that uh, that this should be the sort of last of the technical snags. Um, so yeah, here's hoping. Okay, so first things first. As I already mentioned, um, I, I wanted to give some sort of uh, concrete examples of the sorts of tables of correspondence that I've been talking about. Now, you know, as I already said, you can find examples of these, in fact, in culture all over the place, right? So, you know, it's not uncommon, for instance, for most people to have connected with some kind of remnant of one of these tables of correspondence. So, like, it's very rare that somebody can't tell you um, what their zodiac sign is, right? What the birth sign is. And they can usually tell you a series of corresponding things about it, right? They can tell you the date, right? Obviously, since they're deriving from their birthday, but they can usually tell you a few other things, right? Personality traits that are assigned with it, maybe what element it's assigned to, right? Fire, water, earth, air, right? So there are sort of remnants of it in, in that sense, right? Furthermore, we have other sort of systems of correspondence that still continue to float around a bit. So, you know, you see some ongoing interest in numerology. Numerology is sort of a bit of one of these systems, right? It's kind of left over. Um, we see, uh, of course, interest in tarot. Um, and uh, tarot as a, as a sort of a persistent version of this. Oh, there's some tarot, right? It's really hard to navigate your finger with it. Okay, there, tarot, you see it? Um, so there's uh, tarot as well, right? And tarot, um, of course, I'm sure everybody here has seen tarot cards, but just for reference. Okay, so this is a, a Marseille deck. There are lots of different tarot decks. Um, this is not, in fact, my preferred deck. It's sort of an extra that I have, but okay, so, uh, uh, okay, actually, this is a good example. The first card that I pulled out was one that we've talked about in class. Uh, in fact, was justice, right? Symbol of justice. And we had already discussed somewhat how the, the traits of this, right? Interestingly, this particular version is not blind, um, but it does have the rest of the traits. It's female, it has the scales, it's got the sword, right? Um, oh, there, did it actually be blur? There we go. Um, okay, so, you know, that's a, a fairly good example. But the, um, the point is that, you know, symbolism of this kind, right? Like, consider for a second, there's like a lot going on 
in this card, right? There's a sort of a dense arrangement of symbolism. And much of that has evolved over the period that these things have been use, in use, right? So I've been in use, give or take, for six or 700 years or some pedigrees that trace it uh, older, but, you know, that would be sort of... Um, you know, a, a fairly consistent sort of timeline. So they've been in use for a long time and had, you know, the opportunity to, to develop a bunch of accumulated symbolism. But also there's a tendency to cross-link that symbolism with other things. So um, one really striking example that you see in the West is that when sort of Christianity to a certain extent absorbs the practices of um, uh, Kabbalah, right? Jewish mysticism. Uh, it absorbs along with it a sort of elaboration of the system. So just very briefly, okay? I mentioned this yesterday. So this is a Kabbalistic encyclopedia. This diagram on the cover, okay, is simultaneously one of these systems of correspondence, okay? But also it's a structured map of Kabbalistic practice. Okay, why? Well, the idea is that what this depicts in a, is in a sense, okay, uh, a map of the universe, Okay, so the idea, the, the story within Kabbalah, this thing is called the Tree of Life, or, and you'll pardon my pronunciation, because my Hebrew is not terrific, the uh, uh, Otschim. What this um, thing depicts, okay, is, uh, you know, during the creation story, so God goes to, to create the universe, right? This is the idea. And when he does so, he has to kind of ramp down, he has to ramp down the kind of infinite power in question, right? That's the, that's the myth. And so he creates a series of vessels, right, to sort of channel that power down the line, right, to reduce it into something that's, that's um, more sort of physical and concrete so that he can create a world. Um, and the idea is that sort of each of these spheres, right, Sephiroth as they're called, each of these spheres represents a, a, a stepping down, okay, of that power. So like a transformer, um, I don't know how many of you know this in particular, but like, you know, the electricity that's in the power lines outside your home, right? And the electricity that runs in your home are operating at, at considerably different like amounts of power, right? Fre frequency in a large part. And so what happens is that you have a transformer, okay? You have a set of um, electromagnets basically, right? Of different sizes that are in close proximity to each other. And one sort of pulls power off the other one uh, in a way that reduces it from the extremely high voltage power that you have running outside your home to something that's manageable within your home, something you can actually use to run devices, right? So like if you tried to just plug your cell phone directly into a, a high voltage power line, right, it would instantly explode in your hands and spray your eyes with liquid lithium or something, burning lithium. Mm. So the point is that the transformer steps the power down, right? It, it has this... Um, reduction effect, but that makes it sort of useful within the context. The idea within Kabbalah is that this diagram basically depicts sort of a, a, a structure that God used to step power down, right, to the level where it could create the reality that we experience. Bear in mind that this is like a, a mystical cosmology, but I'm sort of trying to explain it as a prelude to describing both the use of it and how it's one of these systems of correspondence. Okay, so Right at the top, this is the closest thing you're ever going to get uh, from me to slides. I say that now, but we'll see. Anyway, okay. So each one of these spheres um, from the top down has sort of its own quality. The idea is that the, the power came through from this top Sephiroth, Kether, okay, down to this bottom one, Malkuth. Malkuth is deemed to be sort of co-equivalent with the material world, right? Mal Malkuth is the world around you. And if you look closely at it, you can see it's subdivided. You may be reminded here of sort of um, indigenous medicine wheel traditions and things of this kind, right? If you're familiar with that kind of material. But you can see that it's sort of, it's, it's a mixed, right, in its power. That's Malkuth, material reality. Um, okay, Kether is the sphere, as it were, the Sephiroth, which is closest to, uh, to the, the Godhead, which is in some sense, um, you know, like the power, the power of the divine beyond any possible conception. Okay, so it comes in first, and it comes in first, and it's just, it's just, Ener, ener, it's not even energy, actually, because the transition, am I getting this right? Yeah, the transition, the power comes in like this. Boom, to, from, so from sphere one to two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight to nine to ten. Okay, you're going to wonder what all these other paths are, but I'll explain that in a second. Okay, so each of these spheres in turn, okay, um, Kether, right, is sort of just like 
whatever. It's the closest thing to the pure power of creation, right, within the system. Okay. Uh, chokma is, um, is uh, energy, okay, but without form, just energy, just if you can imagine sort of, I don't know, a space full of lightning or something, right, just energy. Bina is form. Um, I'm not going to unpack this completely. I'm just trying to give you some, some signposts. So Bina is form. And these are also the sort of the first two things in the system that are supposed to be respectively um, masculine, chakma, energy, and feminine, form giving. Now, they don't have that quality in, in sort of a, a, a personal sense, right? They're not personalities, but they are loosely speaking energetically masculine in some cosmic, spiritual, metaphorical sense and energetically feminine, right? So this gets associated with sort of lightning and energy and stuff, right? Whereas this is associated with form and often sort of like caves. And the link between, right, the cave, um, uh, the womb, right, the uterus, motherhood, the goddess, right? That's a, that's a very deep human link that we see turn up uh, quite often. And you see it present here in Binna as well. Okay, then you'll notice this gap and we'll come back to that. Then uh, we get to uh, uh, Netzach, okay, which is uh, feminine. So there's kind of a crossover here. This now becomes the feminine side and this becomes the masculine side. Uh, and it has to do with this gap, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Netzach, which is kind of um, um, mercy. It's associated with uh, Jupiter. Okay, so it's like mercy. Uh, this is Geburah, which is associated with judgment. Uh, and it's associated with, with Jupiter, but it's this harsh... Um, kind of judgment sort of force, right? It's really stern. So again, masculine, feminine, right? And sort of mercy and judgment. You can see there's a complementarity to those two things. Okay, in the middle here, we have uh, Tipereth. Tipereth is associated with the sun. Um, it's the highest sphere within this system that has sort of personal associations, right? So this is the place of, as they say, the, the resurrecting solar gods or whatever. But this is like, if you consider that this idea is that it's, it's a map of the universe, not just in the sense that it maps the external world, but it maps the internal world as well and the connections between these two things. So it's like a, this thing is like a bridge between you and God. That's the system. And it's reached inside, as we'll see. But Tipereth is like your highest nature, your heroic solar component. And also it's sort of in the Christianization of this stuff is Christ-like it. Uh, connects the personal and the human to the divine, right? So it's also your sort of divine solar self, right? Your resurrecting self like the sun. Okay. Uh, right. And then, uh, wait, I've lost my uh, train of thought. Okay. S spare you the sputtering for a second. So I may have said that, I may have said one of these spheres above this one was, I think I may have said that was tip, uh, that was Netzach, but actually it's Chesed. So if I said Netzach, anyway, it's Chesed, uh, because this is Netzach, so I was like, wait a second. Uh, Netzach, this is associated with Venus, okay, and with uh, emotionality, okay. Hod, which is associated with intellect and Mercury, right. Um, uh, that's um, uh, Yeshad, I think. Uh, yeah, Yeshad, uh, which is sort of uh, imagination. It's lunar, right, associated with the moon, but it's like imagination, inner space, dreaminess, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see we've gotten down to uh, Malkuth, the material world, okay? So the idea is that the process of creation is a process by which divine potentiality enters and runs through this system, right? Stepping the energy down until it reaches Malkuth, where, where we can kind of manifest. But we contain this bridge microcosmically within our, ourselves. That's sort of the core idea. Now, there are elaborations of this system, okay, that have come about. So one of the interesting elaborations is at some point people notice, wait, this diagram doesn't seem to be quite symmetrical. And uh, there is a certain something to the symmetry, right? So for instance, this side is generally known as the uh, pillar of mercy, right? And you'll notice that it does in fact contain sort of uh, mercy here at, right, at Chesed, uh, whereas Geburah, right, uh, which I mentioned was judgment, uh, is known as the pillar of severity, okay? There's a balanced pillar down the middle, but somebody at some point was like, hey, wait a minute, what's with this gap? Uh, and that's when they proposed the additional Sephiroth of, uh, of Doth. Now Doth, right, Doth, 
um, is the Hebrew word for knowledge, but it's a particular kind of word for knowledge. And so the, the, this is sort of a syncretic tradition, right? Because this emerges with the integration of this original material together with sort of Christian practitioners, right? It becomes this organic syncretic whole. Um, and that I add again, this organic syncretism in these systems is sort of par for the course. So, you know, for understandable reasons, right, people, particularly in the modern era, get very upset about cultural appropriation. I think it's very important, obviously, to, um, to respect the traditions that you are speaking about and not to try to claim a false degree of interiority, like because I don't want to claim expertise about the Kabbalah because I'm not a Jewish mystic, even though I've worked with this thing for a long time, right? But in this kind of syncretic way. The point is, right, there's a degree of um, kind of, you know, friction that's caused by sort of the concept of cultural appropriation and, you know, whatever, the imperialist history and ambitions of colonization and all that stuff. However, a point that I made maybe 20 years ago that, really piss some people off, but that I think still stands, is, you know, it's individuals who are upset by cultural appropriation, because individuals feel ownership over the material, right? Cultures themselves, in my opinion, to whatever extent you can ascribe sort of material to a culture as a whole, don't have a problem with cultural appropriation. In fact, they thrive on it. Um, so appropriation of cultures and the syncretization and admixture of cultures is sort of a universal pattern that you see anytime there are populations of humans with different sets of beliefs and systems living together. So you, you look at India, right? Um, sort of a fascinating test case um, for most of its history of a sort of live and let live, right? There's a lot of stuff going on there and people are not generally running sort of persecutory crusades against each other. Um, but what you get is all these cross connections, right? So as has been pointed out by scholars of religion, it's not even quite correct to say that like Hinduism is a religion. That's an imposition of the British Empire in an attempt to categorize what's going on there. What you have is lots of local variations and religion is not significantly separated out from day-to-day -day life in any real way, right? And you really find that if you're in India, right? It's sort of suffused with this material in a way that it's not here. Religion in, in the West is very often like, that's a thing that happens in the church and in some people's homes, right? So, but, but there's this blending and this cross-fertilization, this cross-pollinization, right? Um, and, and all of that is sort of par for the course. It seems that getting, you know, picked up and replicated in that way uh, is, is very much sort of in line with what cultures want, right, to transmit themselves. So anyway, it, it's just important that we, you know, address that, I think, because the line that I used at the time, which was to be frankly, well, yeah, it was glib, okay? But basically what I said was, you know, I... I kind of think that, uh, you know, my approach is a bit like Indiana Jones, you know, steal reverently. Now that's clearly glib because Indiana Jones <laughs> steals imperialistically and then puts the artifacts in question, you know, in a warehouse and labels them and takes them, you know, so there are problems with that as a metaphor. But the point that I was getting at was that, you know, Indiana Jones respects the things that he's encountering, right? And can, you know, he's taking from different traditions. I mean, the guy encounters Indian magic and he encounters, right, the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail. And those come from different myth systems um, with, you know, and yet he can treat all of them in a certain, right, a certain respectful light and work with them. Steal reverently in some sense was the motto that I used to have around this. Um, and I think it's useful provided that you make sure that really you are being respectful of other people when you acknowledge that a, a degree of cultural appropriation and that kind of material can really step on toes. Anyway, okay, so with that disclaimer in mind. So, uh, so the sort of appropriated syncretic version of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life um, uh, ends up asking the question, what's with the gap? Okay, what's with the gap? And the idea that they come to is that it's, it's this, and it's an interesting twist on the story. So the version that they tell goes like this. God starts the universe, God. God starts the universe, right? And, and, and impours the divine energy, right? So it, gets, it hits Kether, right? Where it is just like undifferentiated Godness, right? Okay, and then first things first, it, it steps down to Chokma, where it becomes energy, not just, I don't know, being, but just sort of energy, right? It's energetic, it it's, has power and motion and can do work, and it's apparently the universal sign for energy. Okay, and then it steps to Bina and it starts to take on form, 
right? So each of the stepping down is also a progressive addition in a sense of the kind of qualities, right? Um, that we associate with, uh, with reality, right? Okay. And then it's supposed to continue, but there's a, there's a flaw. That's the idea. That's their innovation. There's a flaw in the system. Uh, that there's a, a sphere that isn't up to the task. It can't take the power. And so there's, in fact, a sphere here, Duff, which is supposed to step things down between um, Bina, form, and Chesed, mercy. Uh, and what happens instead is as the power goes through, it, it explodes, it breaks it. And this has the effect of, in this system, snapping the universe in half, okay? Um, so there's a sense in which, as I mentioned, right, Malkuth is the, is the world, right? Here's the imagination, intellect, feeling, right? And then we hit Tipereth, the highest, right? The highest level at which the merely human still exists in some sense, right? You can still proceed, you can send your spirit further up the tree, up the ladder, but... Uh, but Tipereth is sort of the highest point where you are represented there, right? Where you have, you know, so this is like your highest self, your solar self or whatever. Then we move up to this level of judgment, right? Judgment and mercy, right? There's a kind of like a gate that is passed through. But by the time we get to judgment and we start to proceed upwards, there is a gulf. And the idea within that particular syncretic version of Kabbalah is that is that the process of pouring the energy into manifest universe snapped the universe in half. Because above that gap, okay, is what's called the supernal triad, okay? So Kether, right, crown, godhead, um, the, uh, the form, or sorry, Chokma, right, energy, and Bina. And this supernal triad, right, which is like the, the most sort of primal, actually manifested, thing within the system is sort of in separated, separated by a gulf. So you, you could theoretically take the center pillar, okay, the center path in this system, but notice that to do so, you would have to move from the solar space, right, the merely personal, there's like a long path here. And the idea in this system was that Daf, this missing 11th um, Severoth, Severoth sphere, became shattered, and so it's a kind of broken sphere. It's like a broken place. It's a void. It's an abyss. It's a gap. Um, you know, sort of mind, mind the gap. It's, um, it's, it's a place where the system breaks down. And in fact, um, you know, in some of these systems, it's possible to sort of fall through death uh, and into what are called the clip-off, um, the husks or shells, um, as opposed to the spheres, which are like anti- versions, negative, demon-haunted, anti-versions of all the spheres. And in some versions of this, this is all incredibly elaborated, and some people chain these into a system of worlds, and people, you know, obviously elaborate the system in all kinds of ways. But that gives you the basics. Now, if you're doing work in this system, okay, and you'll already have picked this up, let's say we're talking about the sphere of, of Hod, okay? Hod is... Uh, is intellect in this really important sense, and it's associated with the planet Mercury and so on and so forth. Okay, so let's say that you want to do work with Hod because you're, say, writing a paper or something. You'll have already noticed that Hod has planetary associations. It has associations with uh, a Hebrew name, which means that it also has associations with Hebrew letters, which themselves naturally have associations with numbers, okay? So every Hebrew letter has a numeric correspondence. Um, do I have this in a chart? That's easy to see. Every Hebrew letter has a numeric correspondence. So there's kind of, within Hebrew, there's a built-in degree of numerology, okay? And that's, you can see that's already a little bit getting at our table of correspondence idea. So right here we have Hod and its intellect, and what else? It's the color orange. Notice that the spheres are all different, right? So it's the color orange. It's the number eight, because 10, nine, oh no, is that right? <laughs> 10, do I have this right? Wait, okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. No, so I have this backwards. 10, 9, 8, 7. So it must be 7. That's right. Yeah, because 6. Okay, so 7. Sorry, I was charting. The, the method that I just charted, incidentally, is known as the magician's path. So theoretically, it's possible within this system of visualization to take any potential of these paths, right, as you chart your way through states of being, right, and, and states of sort of existence on your way from Malkuth back to Kether, 
okay? Um, but there is something known as the magician's path or the magician's ladder, sometimes the magician's um, lightning it's called, which is you completely retrace the path by which the energy entered the system to get, begin with, right? The zigzaggy. You hit all nine spheres. Why? Well, one is that magicians as a group tend to be possessed by a certain degree of, of uh, hubris. And so there's a kind of an arrogance, I think, that's present to it, right? It's like, you, you know, you're going through creation like a goddamn tourist, um, you know, hitting, hitting the sites, you know, top, top 10 dimensions I need to visit on my way to God. Anyway, but, um, you know, the idea is, you know, in theory, that's not necessary. In theory, if you had these properties balanced, you could just ascend to the center pillar. Right? In which case it would be like, okay, Malkuth, material world, Yeshad, imagination, Tempereth, the solar, right, higher nature, higher being, right, the sun associated with, and then straight to Kether, jumping over death if your, if your version of it happens to include death. So jumping over the abyss, um, the, the void of Karanzan, right, a, a corrosive place. Mm. Okay, so how does one move between these paths? Now again, this depends on which version of this particular system you happen to be um, employing. But within the fairly standard uh, Christian syncretic version, right, that is the version that uh, you know, lots of people sort of encounter, people have added additional correspondences to all this. So Hod, okay, if you wanted to do work with Hod, um, yes, it's Mercury, yes, it's the number set. That's gonna drive me crazy, sorry. Uh, hot, 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 hot. John, God. The letter H. This episode is brought to you by the letter H. It's gonna make me nuts. It's the eighth. So wait, 10, nine, eight, seven, six. Wait, 10, 10. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh, yeah, I did have it right. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, I was right. I just had it. It's because I'm looking at it on the screen, and so it looks reversed, which keeps throwing me off. I'm used to, of course, looking at it head on, but, yeah, that's right. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Okay, so, HOD. So, you want to go to HOD. So it's the eighth, not the seventh. And that kind of threw me. It's the eighth, not the seventh, right? And so it's associated with Mercury and it's associated with the color orange and it's associated with intellect and it's associated with um, Hebrew letters and it's associated thus with numbers, right? Through a basic system of, of numerology. Um, and it's associated with all that stuff. So what, okay, that tells you about the nature of the sphere, right? And you can think of that as being a bit like, you know, when we were talking about summoning up Venus and we were like, okay, Venus has a bunch of things that are sacred to her, right? The goddess Aphrodite, Venus, so love, okay, and flowers and you know, frankincense and the color green and the metal copper. And if you were constructing this ritual space in order to try to bring this, this kind of energy up, right? You can imagine furnishing the space, right? With things in every kind of sensory modality in every domain that stand in for, right? Stand in for each other. Now, you'll remember when we talked about the distinction between versions of the word is, right? The logical and the analogical. And the thing is that this particular use of the word is um, sort of equivocates between that, because what they're saying is that it's not the case, of course, that, you know, copper is the planet Venus, is love at one level. But at a different level, they're saying, no, no, but actually they are logically equivalent. That's the whole point. Underneath that, the mystical language indicates that this is a valid way of cutting reality up to reveal sort of an underlying divine principle or rulership, right? So if you were constructing a ritual around Venus, right, not, not in this system, I just mean sort of more generally, right, around Aphrodite, you were trying to summon up love for love spell, you would construct a ritual space in which you had all of these different properties there so that you could appropriately focus yourself conceptually into the, the goddess space of Aphrodite, okay? So that you could contact it, summon it, bring it into yourself, make requests of it or whatever you were gonna do. Likewise, right, this system clearly has similar kinds of powers, right? So like every one of these spheres has, you know, spirits that rule it, right? Archangels and beings that are associated with it as well. But how do you get, how do you get around? How do you get between? And that's one of the innovations of 
um, of the syncretic version, which is to say that somebody at some point counts up the paths that are between, okay, these, the 10 Sephiroth, uh, and realizes that there are 22 paths, which ooh, corresponds with the major arcana of the tarot, of the revised tarot. So the revised tarot, modern tarot, where is it? I lost it. Oh, yeah, it's up there. Okay. Modern tarot uh, has, a, has 78 cards, okay? We're used to tarot sort of, in its, most of us are used to it in a, in a somewhat boiled down form, right? Form, right? Playing cards. Playing cards are derived squarely from, from tarot. So the four suits of playing cards derive from the four suits of tarot. So what are the four suits of playing cards, right? So again, playing cards, playing cards are the leftover of a system of correspondence, right? That totally innocuous, extremely common object that we're used to seeing in the environment comes out of not just a game, but a system of divination and a system of correspondence, right? So there are four suits within, um, four, four different suits within playing cards. And what are they? They're uh, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades, right? Okay. So each of those derives from sort of a tarot predecessor, right? Um, hearts derives from... Uh, cups, I believe, okay? And both things were traditionally associated with the clergy, water and with the clergy, right? Cups, because the, right, the clergy, the priesthood uh, carried the, the chalice that, right, transformed wine into the blood of Christ and blah, 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 right? Medieval society. Okay, so cups were hearts. Um, diamonds were the uh, merchant class, okay? And diamonds correspond, generally speaking, to coins or pentacles, uh, I believe. I think that's right, yeah. Um, right? Uh, uh, clubs corresponds to staves or wands in the system and, and refers to sort of the, the cudgel of the working farmer. So again, you can see there's a correspondence between these classes of society, and there's a correspondence between the symbolism involved, there's an elemental correspondence, right? If that's an earth symbol, um, right? Coins is a, um, shit, what is it, air? There's coins, air, and staves is, oh, anyway, I'd have to look it up quick, but I don't do that much work with playing cards. Okay, and then uh, spades, right? Uh, suit spades is associated with the traditional suit swords, which is obviously associated with the warrior class. So again, right there with playing cards, you can see that there is the leftover, the leftover, because we don't consciously connect with that level of cut through, but what do we got? We have four suits, okay? And then within those suits, what do we have? We have numbered cards leading up to um, like trump cards, right? So numbered cards, right? So the cards go from, you know, two, right? Up to 10, okay? And then we get uh, Jack, what is it? Jack, Queen, King, Ace. And then there's a couple of Jokers floating around in the deck. Okay, now the Joker is in many ways, right, the leftover of the traditional sort of first card of the major arcana within the tarot, the Fool. And the Fool is a figure, he's, you know, walking towards a cliff, right, he's walking towards a cliff, the edge of a cliff, typically he's taking one step off the cliff, he's got a dog nipping at his heels, and he's got a, a bindle staff, right, like a traditional hobo's um, pack, where you take a stick and you have like a, a kerchief tied around it, you would see this in like... Great Depression era, you know, cartoons and depictions of hobos and stuff. So here we go, and the, the fool is blithely walking off the edge of the cliff with the, right, nipping on his heels. And that's the first card. That's card zero of the major arcana, of which there are 22 cards in the tarot. So you get a couple of jokers. You see those left over. You see some of the other cards preserved because within the tarot, there's the major arcana, right? This is these cards like justice and like temperance and like the devil and like the sun and the moon these bigger kind of concepts. And then you get four suits. You get pentacles, you get swords, right? You get staves or wands, and you get cups. And the idea is, again, those correspond to, right, medieval sections of society, they correspond to elements, but they also correspond to components of being, right? So, you know, traditionally speaking, right? Uh, yeah, wands, wands are air, right? Uh, stabs is what threw me off. I was thinking earth because it's digging, but no, wands because wands are air. So, uh, so right, you have cups and cups are priests and right, the, the cup of transformation and cups contain water and water is emotionality and right, those are all sort of baseline associations that you have around that stuff. And then you have a hierarchy of cards within the tarot deck akin to the kind of numbers that you get. So you have like the seven of wands or the seven of 
you know, swords or whatever. And that proceeds upwards, right, kings, until you then break and you hit the, the 22 cards of the major arcana. And that's where you get sort of, you know, right, from, from the fool to, what's the final card? The world, I think. The universe, the world. Yeah, I believe that's the final card of the sequence. Never remember the sequence exactly. Um, and there are some cards that interest me more than others um, as whatever, dilettante. So the point is, when the syncretic merging um, of these uh, systems occurred, one of the things that people did was they took this existing system and they realized there were 22 paths and they mapped the tarot cards to the paths. So what does this mean? Well, it gives you an integrated system right, within practice for visualization. Yes, yes, so you wanna to go to, to Hod, right? Okay, so you're starting in Malkuth, you start in the physical world, and maybe you would draw a circle and banish and ground yourself and whatever, and then you're gonna to start to visualize. And so the first move is you have to follow the first path up, right? And what's the first path up? Uh, la, 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 la. The first path up from Foundation, Kingdom, Splendor. Okay, so here, here is a sort of an expanded version of this chart, if you can see, okay. And if you were heading, it's path 32, but I can't remember which tarot card is associated with it off the top of my head. Um, okay, anyway, it doesn't matter that much. I can look it up in the downtime and come back to it. So. Um, the point is that you're, you're following that path, which was associated with a particular tarot card, uh, right? A particular major arcana tarot card. So let's just off the bat say it's the fool, just for sake of reference, okay? So the idea is you're moving from one thing, Malkuth, which is going to have a set of associations, right? And a set of sort of magical practices that are meant to ground you in it ritually. And then you're doing a visualization, which allows you to proceed through a path of, of action, a set of visualizations, that's a path, that eventually lands you in Yeshad, where it's purple and it's imagination and it's lunar and it's the world of the dead a little bit, and right? That set of associations. And then there's gonna be a different tarot path, which is going to theoretically lead you, right, in the next stage, and then you're going to end up in Hod, right, which is like uh, intellect, it's, you know, um, golden -y orange and, you know, logically derived and mercurial and so on and so forth, okay? I mean, mercurial in the sense of sort of Hermes, that kind of, right, uh, hard uh, thought sort of thing. Okay, so, that's what I'm getting at in part, right? This thing is like an integrated set of symbols and you can see how there are leftover chunks of it just in our day-to-day -day experience all over the place. Okay, just to give you an idea a little bit because I already mentioned that there's correspondences between Hebrew letters that are sort of built in and numbers. That kind of gives some idea. You can see that chart, right? So these are like the basic Hebrew letter, the name of the Hebrew letter, right? English correspondence, that's fine. But then also notice that there are sort of standard mystical and numerical correspondences on these things, right? Now, there are practices that already exist within Jewish mysticism that take advantage of that. So for instance, okay, there's a practice called um, gematria, where um, essentially speaking, what you do is you take a Hebrew word, right, out of the Torah, which is deemed to be the word of God. And every letter in that word has a certain numerical value, okay? Which means that the sort of sum total of the word is gonna have the same numerical value. And what that means that is that if you shuffle the letters up, like word scramble, right, you shuffle the letters up and reorganize them, okay, then, um, what, you know, it has the same underlying number, so it's got the same essence, the same truth. You can see again how this is an echo of the tables of correspondence kind of thing, right? But it means that sort of different words actually share this underlying divine reality. And one of the ideas with the sects that practice gematria is that they believe that the Torah, right, the Bible, such as we have it on earth, is actually scrambled right? It's, it's a scrambled version. Uh, and that by reorganizing it, they learn sort of truths of the underlying divine reality, but also eventually it could theoretically be shuffled into the correct sequence, right? It could give the actual truth in some sense, right? So the deeper truth. So again, there's a system of correspondence. But what I want to point out here is 
we have a system of Jewish mysticism, right? It gets absorbed into a kind of Christian syncretism and extra things are, are added in, right? So tarot suddenly becomes associated, okay. And tarot has numeric associations, symbolic associations, cultural associations, right? It's associated with different elements. It's associated with different uh, properties of um, human being. It's associated with you know, right, social classes, right? But then also that becomes a system that connects things together and that is all still to some extent around us. There are astrological correspondences in this thing, right? Yeah, so you might, I mean, you might know all of this, but you know, the average person in Western society these days might know their astrological sign and they probably have a deck of playing cards around the house, right? And um, you know, it's possible that they will have, you know, some other little bits. I know I was talking about David Bowie, um, before, because I'm, I'm a big fan of Bowie, um, but you know the my favorite David Bowie song for this reason, uh, in some ways, is the song "Station to Station." Okay, so it's on the album "Station to Station," which is an amazing album, uh, and I would encourage you to like get a good set of headphones and sit down and listen to that song. If Bowie isn't your jam, okay, but this is a period where Bowie was very deep into this stuff because uh, Bowie was an active magical practitioner for quite a while. Um, and you can tell because the guy was an accomplished shapeshifter. Um, so, uh, yes, like uh, Madonna after him. But he kind of, anyway, he's, he's a very mercurial, androgynous, fascinating figure if you consider him across his various sort of incarnations, if you're into Bowie. So Bowie does station to station. And now, granted, he was doing a ton of cocaine. But also, right, which, as we mentioned, has a way of hypercharging dopamine and thus creating hyper-associative networks, very conducive to this kind of thing, right? But also, he's sort of wired up, and he's doing a ton of magic. He's very deep into this stuff. So in some ways, he's probably, like, a bit too deep, honestly, into this kind of um, schizotypal space. But, you know, he pulls himself back out. So the song Station the Station, which is like seven, eight minutes long, you can listen to it on YouTube. It's the signature track on that album, which is quite good anyway. Were it not for that song, my vote for Best Bowie would go to Diamond Dogs, but, which is also a great album and kind of eerily post-apocalyptic, but fun, danceable. Uh, so maybe it's good listening for this season, season of travail. Um, okay, but if you listen to... To Bowie, what he talks in this song, essentially, he's like, one, one magical movement from Kether to Malkuth is an actual lyric in the song. Station to station is, in fact, a reference to this thing, right? There is an idea that you'll sometimes see in magical practice that you can think of these things like subway stations, right? So there are trains and subway stations. Um, and you'll sometimes see some fun things where, like, the London Underground or something will be sort of mapped in Kabbalistic fashion. Um, Alan Moore, for people that are comic book fans, did a terrific comic book called Promethea, which was sort of his take, his extremely magical take on um, sort of Wonder Woman almost. Um, so he creates a kind of Wonder Woman. Uh, and, uh, but what he also does is he takes a whole middle stretch of the 32 issues, right? 32, 10 spheres and, right? And 22 paths, that's again, intentional. But he takes uh, a bunch of the middle issues of that series and sort of gives like a crash course in a lot of this material. So if you want actually a good visual reference um, for this uh, stuff, you could definitely refer to it. Now, he's come under some criticism because he's like, oh, he sort of turns it into like a visual theme park, right? Oh, it's like a series of lands you can visit. And that's not quite right. These are meant to be states of being, states of consciousness, right? Because a state of consciousness and a state of being and the way we experience the world, we're all deeply intertwined. If you're in a different state of consciousness, you both are a different being, generally, and also you experience a different world. There's a continuity. That's part of the sort of game around getting this is that that continuity from microcosm to macrocosm is expressed in states of consciousness. Different cultures have different versions of this, right? There isn't a final kind of version. So this happens to be a, um, a Judeo-Christian sort of mystical interpretation of this stuff, right? Filtered through a magical lens. But anyway, Station to Station by Bowie. So you might sit and you would start by generating a circle and banishing and so on and so forth. And then you're going to follow these paths, station to station. So maybe you've got a Bowie album in your house. At the very least, you probably have a Spotify account. You don't. I'm curious about that. Do you just listen to vinyl? I know people listen to vinyl. I don't listen to vinyl at all anymore. It's all electronic for me, even though I know the sound quality is lower. But anyway, um, 
right? You probably got playing cards around. You probably know, you know, your astrological sign and probably a bit about that. But those are the shreds and leftovers of what was originally a much more comprehensive system. And because it was a much more comprehensive system for the practitioners who were trained in using this stuff, okay, um, they could use it to navigate their interior states and ritual space in this highly effective way. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Now, I said I would also go through the Magician's Companion, and I will a little bit. Like, I'll just show you some examples of that. Random jazz. Hold on. Uh, 